Hey there, comrades. So today we're going to be discussing Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific by Frederick Engels. Our discussion ran long, shocker, so we are dividing this up into two parts. Part one will cover the first two sections of the document, which is development of utopian socialism and dialectics. So you can find this reading for free at marxist.org. Be sure to check that out if you want to follow along. If you want to be a big nerd, you can subscribe to our Patreon and you can get access to my notes, which have cool drawings on them, which we will refer to. All right, so I wrote a special Christmas poem for you all. I hope you enjoy. Let's go. Twas the night before revolution, when all through the prole, not a comrade was stirring, not a single soul. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in the hopes that communism soon would be there. My comrades were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of solidarity danced in their heads. When out by the commune there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. An old bearded man, full of smart remarks, I knew in a moment he must be Karl Marx. More rapid than riots, his comrades they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Engels, now Shea, now Trotsky and Lenin, on Huey, on Mao, on Bernie and Goldman. To the top of the tax bracket, to the street called Wall, revolution for the people, hang them all. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, communism to all, and to all a good fight. Hell yeah, dude. That was <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Did you know that poem is actually pretty long? <laughs> I only took out the iconic parts. Like the whole thing. Oh, yeah, because he's got to like do his nose thing and he's got the mm -hmm. bowl full of jelly. Yes. There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot to it. Awesome, dude. That was cool. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. What are we talking about today? Now that the poetry hour is finished. <laughs> oh, wait. For, I forgot. What are we doing? Uh, I was doing some snap claps for your poetry slam. Oh, okay. I was like, I thought this was like an audio syncing thing. <laughs> I was very confused. I was like, that's not going to be enough. That's of a not going to help. <laughs> no, thank you. I did it for extra credit. Extra credit, you get 10 points. Fuck, I'm going to need it based on these notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, based on. So let's go ahead and start. We are going to be talking about Friedrich Engels's socialism, utopian, and scientific. Okay. And some people just call him Frederick Engels. It doesn't matter. He's not around to like complain one way or the other. So wait, what did you call him? Friedrich. That's just his German, you know, name. Friedrich oh, okay. Or Frederick. It doesn't matter. That's fine. He doesn't care. He's dead. <laughs> He's dead. Uh, yeah. So let's get started. Okay. First off, I want to complain. This was hard. <laughs> this was a little bit more than the Communist <laughs> Manifesto was. Which was yeah. also, I think, you know, remember back to that, that was also hard reading for us. It was. This is harder, I guess, than the Communist Manifesto was in that it's longer. Mm -hmm. It's in that same old style of writing and stuff. So sometimes <laughs> you're kind of like, what? <laughs> what is that? Yeah, I felt like I was in college again in my postmodernism class, except mm -hmm. I couldn't bullshit my way out of this one. <laughs> so it was rough. I... Listeners, if you do get on the Patreon, you'll see that it's every other paragraph. It's just question marks and like, what does this mean? And yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At so, one point, I'd do a doodle of myself saying, I'm dumb. <laughs> uh, now, for anybody approaching this, this is what is annoying about online leftists saying, go read theory, because then this is like a simpler theory to read. And you're like, what? What is what am I supposed to get from this? It takes a lot of annoying work to try to derive meaning from it. Yeah, I think, I mean, not to sound, I don't know, saintly, but that's definitely why I wanted to start this podcast. It's just, mm -hmm. I was really frustrated with those kinds of remarks. And just reading this, I'm just like, I need a fucking translation. Like, <laughs> just dumb it down. Yeah. And I guess it's like with anything, any sort of inside group, any sort of online community is there's a jargon that rises up that... Mm -hmm. Helps people kind of identify like, oh, you're in the in group. You're cool. You get it. <laughs> With leftists, it's the same thing. You want to you wanna kind of section off and be like, we're cool. You're not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. All right. Well, we're going to give you the secrets to being cool. <laughs> yes. The secrets to being cool, but maybe not the secrets to sound like you're being cool. I'm not interested in teaching <laughs> you like all the, oh, make sure to use this word and not this word. Cause, no, actually. Like, 
I want to make it to where don't it makes be sense one of those douches. Yeah, yeah. Imagine yeah. if someone listened to this podcast and then turned around and was like a douche to someone about theory. Well, uh, actually, if you would listen to Teach Me Communism, you would know <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> you would fail the class. That's the only way to fail this class. <laughs> yeah. Um, or to, you know, become a capitalist or something. Yeah. That's bad. Yeah. So let's give a little bit of background to this particular work here, Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. Okay. Just so you know kind of where it comes from. Uh, it is a TLDR summary of Marx's Capital. Wow. Never reading that. This is the TLDR. <laughs> this is the TLDR. Fuck me. Mar Marx wrote Capital, 1867, is when the first of multiple volumes is published. Engels actually, I think, publishes the last volume after Marx is dead. This is how, like, wow. lengthy of a work this is. I was going to say, like, was Marx okay? Like, Jesus. No, Marx was <laughs> in chronic bad health pretty much for his later Aww. life because he just had a lot of, you know, issues and stuff. It's supposed to be more accessible, you know, to regular working people. And Engels is trying to kind of explain what he terms scientific or modern socialism is. Mm-hmm. The book actually was originally written in 1878 as part of a, it was actually a larger book called Anti-During. What does that mean? <laughs> which is a work which in its original German was titled Her Eugen During's Revolution in Science, which is just making fun of this guy, Eugene During. <laughs> it's a burn book. Yeah. It was just all about how his particular form of socialism was stupid. That's great. Okay. So, you know, in the translated title and like the shortened title, it just becomes known as anti-during because that's like <laughs> what the book was about. <laughs> Petty. I love it. Yeah. So in 1880, after kind of bothering Marx and saying like, dude, your book's too complicated. No one's going to read it. <laughs> Please shorten it. And Marx was just like, I don't want to do that. That's a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> Engels was just like, fine. He takes three chapters out of his this book that he has by now already written and, you know, kind of rearranges it a little and puts it in here. And that's what we get. Okay. So it's supposed to be this kind of short summary of what Marx and Engels's theory of scientific socialism is all about. Okay. I mean, again, <laughs> it's not simple. Uh, I don't know if people were smarter back then, the working man, but, or they just didn't know what the working man wanted to hear. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> well, Engels wasn't too disconnected. Now, both Marx and Engels were very, you know, well, I mean, they were academics, they were philosophers mm -hmm. uh, and everything. So they, they were educated. Engels, uh, his like lifelong partner was a working class woman, uh, Mary Burns. Oh, okay. And so like he had a lot of connection with it, which was frustrating to his like upper class family. They were judgy capitalists. He actually is a factory manager for a while because his oh, father- Oh, I remember like, we talked about that. Yeah. And his, his parents were always like, stop with this revolution stuff please come home be proper all this and he's just like no fuck you awkward I, I don't know i think they were kind of in tune with 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 the working people it's just that you usually learned not by reading directly but by having things read and discussed mm. in a kind of an oral tradition sort of thing so this only had to appeal to like whoever were the people in the town that were like kind of the thinkers and the readers and stuff. And so then okay, they would go okay. and kind of discuss these ideas and people, regular people could join in and be like, what is that? They'd explain it and be like, well, that's good or that's bad. Okay. Okay. So this was like a, a tool to get it across. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> it wasn't like you would have to read this like after your job at the factory or something. Like you would usually go yeah, and like settle talk down and it. read this theory. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in general, the overall kind of outline of where this is going, Engels is going to start um, laying out his theory in kind of a slow sequence. Starts by discussing the lessons of the utopian socialists. Okay. Then he uh, moves on to kind of outlining the history of philosophy. I hated that part. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, I'm just like, why did we do that? Like, once I finished the whole thing, I was like, that didn't seem to be necessary to me. Well, it was all kind of to lay out the part about dialectics. And we'll end up trimming that whole thing down a lot. <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, and lastly, he explains the history of capitalism through the lens of historical materialism. Uh, and how ultimately the working class will liberate themselves and liberate Fuck humanity. Yeah. See, I liked that part. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't like the nerd shit. <laughs> All right. So we'll start with a, a couple of vocabulary terms that will help us in the first section and kind of throughout the work. Okay. Well, there's a lot of vocabulary terms, I guess. So I kind of will scatter them throughout. Um, once we get to that section, I'll be like, okay, so for this section, we'll need, you know, 
Mm, okay, okay. Uh, so starting out, one thing you're going to need to know is the means of production. Yes, we've talked about this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so just a reminder for our listeners and everything, the means of production is talking about uh, everything that you use to make stuff minus people. Okay, so all the equipment, factories, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. There's different categories in it or whatever. And the means of labor is like your tools, your factories, the building, all that stuff. And then you have like your raw materials, which are called the subjects of labor. You know, what do you hit with the hammer Mm. to make a thing? Okay, okay. But the shortened, you know, what you need to know about the means of production is just the stuff you need to make stuff minus people no people i find it helpful to take it out of the factory because Mm -hmm. i think that's what most people think about and it's like that's helpful but like a lot of us don't work in factories yeah so maybe like okay let's just take my job like that would be my laptop that would be like all my equipment that i use right yes yeah all the equipment that you use minus you using it Mm -hmm. okay and then like in a non-covid world that would probably be the office space too yeah, the office space, the uh, the land that the office is on, the utilities, or yeah, all the all of that. The in a restaurant, the building, mm-hmm. the kitchen, the food, the mm. the plates, the land it's on, all that. That's means of production. Okay. Everything minus the people. All right, another vocab term to know is productive forces. This one comes okay, up what several are these? times. Yeah, I was confused by this. Productive forces is just the means of production plus labor. Okay. That's okay. easy. So it's all of it. It's your produ- society's productive capacity shortened. Okay. How much shit can we make? Okay. That makes right? sense. Our productive forces is just how much can we put out there? Okay. So is it just the stuff plus the people or is it also the output? Because I feel like that's a different thing. Uh, it's your capability of producing output. Okay. Okay. That's, that's a good distinction. You don't, uh, I don't know. It's not like including the pile of stuff that you made. It's just looking at the capacity. Yeah. Looking at how much services, how many goods and stuff can you produce? Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Next we have the mode of production, which is needlessly similar to means of production. It doesn't need to be yeah. that. Uh, but it's, it's capitalism is an example feudalism is an example it's just the overall oh. way of producing something okay so it's it's like your your economic structure whatever that is <laughs> yeah it's it's the system that you're in yeah oh, that, that one was really confusing i kept thinking it was the other one and then i was like wait is this like a mean median mode thing like <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean it may be all because it's translated from german it may make more sense mm. there or something but mode of production just refers to the overall system Uh, Initially, this is based on those productive forces and also the relations of production, like who's in charge, like, you know, serf and lord or Mm, like employer, employee, whatever. All right. Their org chart. Yeah. That's like the system that you're in. Mode of production. That'll come into play later, too. Um, And then a couple of reminders about like the titles for everybody in this. So like the bourgeoisie, (laughs) for example. Impossible to spell. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that was the most frustrating part of making the notes for this is uh, wrong every time. <laughs> I just type vowels until autocorrect steps in and saves me. <laughs> um, so another the adjective form of this is bourgeois. It just looks a little spelled differently. So that's also annoying. Oh, uh, another way to think of this is <laughs> capitalists. Yes. Okay. Uh, if this is the capitalist class. Those who under capitalism, they own the means of production. Okay, so yes. they're the ones who own the stuff to make uh, to make things out of, or to, to produce goods and services. I think we've talked about this before, but this can be kind of a spectrum, yes? Like, you can be yeah. the CEO, but you can also be somebody's boss and not be the CEO. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and this, you know, strangely, like, we use this as a kind of synonym sometimes for middle class or something, right? Mm-hmm. That is weird to me. Yeah, it kind of originated from there, actually. You know, it was the people who lived in the boroughs or the cities. That's where the word comes from. Oh, okay. And so at the time, they were the middle class because they weren't, you know, priests or nobility or something. Royalty. They weren't, yeah. Yeah. But they, you know, but they weren't serfs or something. But That's interesting. Bourgeoisie, you're right. They have a spectrum. You can be, you know, the hot bourgeoisie, the high bourgeoisie, and <laughs> be like, you know, the upper 
middle class, or you can be in the petty bourgeoisie, kind of the small businesses. Mm-hmm. Middle management. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't it doesn't mean that you what am I trying to say here? Yeah, because management you still don't own. Yeah, management yeah. is not it. So management, if you're drawing a wage, mm-hmm. you're in a different class. Okay. If you if you have to sell your labor and you don't own stuff to make money out of, if you if you don't own the means of production yourself, if you are not exploiting people, if you're not hiring people, then you are not a bourgeoisie. You're okay. in this other class. You're in the proletariat. Hell yeah, that's a cool one. The proletariat. Another way to think of them is the workers. Okay, they're the working class. In capitalism, they do not own the means of production. They don't own any of that stuff at all. They instead, really, the only way they can make their living is by selling the only thing that they control, which is their own labor. Mm-hmm. So if even if you're a middle manager, even if you're kind of like a well-paid, you know, it's, it's not about income. Sometimes liberals like to break it down and say, you know, the, the rich over here or the upper middle class, I don't know. It's like white you, collar. Yeah, if you kind of break it down like that, you're going to get off in the weeds. You don't want to do, you don't want to just focus on that. You want to focus on the actual, like, how does that person get by? Yeah, yeah. Um, And the last thing that I wanted to address here, because it does come up in this section, I think, is capital. Okay. What does that mean? Uh, We'll mention it (laughs) a lot throughout here. Uh, And it's odd because it does have a couple different ways that Engels uses it. Okay, so one, it's money. (laughs) <laughs> that's one of the reasons or the one of the definitions. Yeah. And it's specifically money that's used to buy things in order to make a profit. So like if you're using yes. money to like, if I use some money to go buy a sandwich, mm-hmm. that's not capital. <laughs> you didn't make an investment in that sandwich. Right. If I go use my money to buy a sandwich shop, then that's capital. Okay. <laughs> sandwich versus sandwich shop. Yeah. So you're buying things, trying to make a profit from it. So when he talks about, you know, oh, there's concentration of capital or the buildup of capital or whatever, that's what he means. Okay. Another meaning is like a substitute for just talking about the capitalist class. Oh, okay. So he'll talk about like the interests of capital or the opposition between capital and labor. He's talking about capitalists. Mm, okay. And he's just using this word capital. So that can be confusing sometimes, <laughs> but he doesn't mean like a pile of money versus... <laughs> An angry pile of money. Yeah. All right. So those are the definitions. Great. Let's jump in here. All right. All right. Jumping in here, we got utopian socialism. That's our first section. It's called the development of utopian socialism. All right. I have an idea for how we should go through this. Okay. I think at the beginning of each section, I should try to give a really shitty summary and you tell me how close I got. I like it. All right. Cool. (laughs) Okay. All right. My dumb summary is... He's making fun of utopians. Like, that's it. That's the that's the headliner here. I don't even need to get into detail. He's just like, they're wrong. Partially. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. He does point out that they're wrong, but he also is careful to say we shouldn't spend a lot of time making fun, really. We shouldn't be like, oh, these, these guys are dumbasses. Here's why they're wrong. He says that while they were incorrect... There's some important little kernels of that we want to pick, that we want to kind of acknowledge, and that's part of, like, how we got to where we are today. Oh, is that the last part where he's like, they only couldn't succeed because it wasn't time, basically? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah. We'll stick this to just a broad outline here, or we could get really bogged down. But he starts kind of by talking about, like, the philosophers of, like, the French Revolution. Mm Mm-hmm. And he says, like, these guys were kind of radical and whatever, but they were like enlightenment, the thinkers, and they weren't correct. Yeah, that's what I wrote. That's what it seemed like. Like, it was all because of justice, and it was like, oh, obviously we should do revolution because it's smart. Yeah, it's correct to do. Yeah, the eternal truth and all that. Yeah. Um, They saw reason as supreme, and he's just like the later utopians that he's going to talk about with these guys, he also says, look, this was just, you know, that's their era, man. That's what they, that's what they thought. It's not like they were morons. It's, you know, this was, was what they thought. This this is what Mm -hmm. they were doomed to do. The French revolution is all like, oh, reason's the best thing. Reason should be supreme. But really what he says, that was actually just kind of the supremacy of the bourgeoisie of the, of the ascendant capitalists, you know, Mm, that makes sense. They weren't really like full on capitals yet, but like the people who would become it. And he also kind of 
points out like the working class like outbursts that they had Mm -hmm. that didn't really make it never kind of got a really good expression they hadn't developed as a class is the way he puts it okay like they hadn't become a real working class so sometimes they're like oh let's you know we're in charge like the uh he talks about the the reign of terror yeah yeah and says you know that there we go we got you know we got the people in charge for a little bit uh but it didn't like it didn't work It didn't go so hot, from what I understand. I don't know a lot about the French Revolution, but I know that part sucked. Yeah. um, So the way Engels breaks it down is he says that, like, the attempt at these rational Enlightenment thinker philosophers, guys, to base everything on reason failed. He says um, that the state and that the society that they tried to build based on reason, you know, it just collapses and you have the reign of terror. You've got Napoleon in doing all these imperial wars everywhere. Uh, you end up with just the capitalists in charge and everything kind of goes to shit. Napoleon's one of those figures. I don't know. Maybe he just had an old ass fashion sense, but I never know what time period he was in. <laughs> I'm always like surprised by how long he was around. Napoleon is 1790s to like the 18, 1812, 1815, I think. Is. I see them very late. Like, gone to my head, I would have put them before the revolution. That's just me showing my whole ass again on the podcast. Yeah, uh, that's, <laughs> that's wrong. <laughs> that's wrong. All right, continue. <laughs> so he, he basically says, like, that was all. It had obviously failed. And he's only kind of using this as an introduction to the people he wants to talk about, to the three great utopian socialists, as he puts it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, what um about that kind of early outline, the failure of the Enlightenment? What do you what's your what are your thoughts? So I had questions looking over my notes. So I have this note here. It seems like the reason it failed was because they needed the wage workers and but they didn't have them as part of the struggle. Is that right? I'm trying to translate this shit. Um, okay, I see. So you're talking about this passage here where he talks about the bourgeoisie trying to represent like the whole of society, but is actually only representing just like just the bourgeoisie section. Mm hmm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, the French Revolution is a revolution against the clergy, which is the first estate mm-hmm. in the old system, and the nobles, the second estate. The third estate was everybody else, oh. which includes the nascent uh, capitalists at the top, and then the toiling masses, everyone else. Okay. So whenever the third estate has this revolution, everyone has these kind of ideas, you know, liberty, equality, fraternity. That that's going to apply to everyone, but the end result, because it's actually the bourgeoisie who's moving it, mm. is that while they use the workers, the people, the small <laughs> folk to, to take power and put people's heads on pikes, they don't actually follow through with, hey, you guys are all like emancipated, liberated, free, you know, because yeah. that's not what they're actually about. <laughs> no, they're like, get to work. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So that's when you end up with, you know, that contradiction is there. You know, they said they were going to do this, but it's this. So it ends up collapsing into this kind of inconsistent mess. All right. I had another question. Mm -hmm. Later on, he talks about freedom of property and freedom from property. Mm -hmm. What the fuck is he talking about? Uh, So where he's talking about that is when when everything does fall apart compared to the rosy promises that they had. It's because, you know, the bourgeoisie took mastery and therefore then the capitalists, you know, started imposing their system to a greater degree. So as capitalism grows, and we'll talk about this a little more detail later, but as capitalism grows, you've got bigger and bigger businesses, basically, you know, bigger and bigger Mm -hmm. factories or whatnot, out competing the small artisans and everything. And so everyone who was like, oh, I'm going to be free to produce and everything instead of having to deal with the old feudal lords. Now they're oh. getting out competed by, you know, the big businesses. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So the freedom of property becomes freedom from property when they get, you know, when they run bankrupt and they're they're put out. Okay. I think that was all my questions for that section. All right. So um then he goes on to the to what he calls the three great utopian socialists, San Simon, Fourier, and Owen. If you are on the Patreon, you get to see that I doodled over these guys' pictures. <laughs> They're good doodles, too. Thank you. 
And um, he says, basically, these guys are similar to the earlier Enlightenment philosophers because they see reason and justice as, you know, the good things, the important things. We should do that. But they just have like a different opinion, you know, from the Enlightenment guys. Okay. Uh, he also points out that like these guys, you know, they are also a product of their historical moment and that it's okay or it makes sense for them to have these theories. Uh, he calls them crude. Mm. To the crude conditions of capital's production and the crude class conditions correspond crude theories. So what he's saying okay. is their historical moment, capitalism is not ready yet. All right. So the class conditions aren't ready yet. So neither are their theories. Like this is incomplete. Okay, okay. You know, he's, he's kind of like apologizing for him, sort of. <laughs> it's not their fault. Yeah. Um, they attempted to come up with this ideal social order just kind of like out of the brains, dream it up. What if we do this? You know, that would be cool. <laughs> and I like that he mentions here that we can leave it to the literary small fry. I loved that line. <laughs> yeah. To solemnly <laughs> quibble over these fantasies, which today only make us smile. Uh, and he, you know, he's basically saying it's not worth our time to be like, Oh no, you know, actually that was incorrect. Uh, it should be this way. Uh, we shouldn't bother with that too much. Just know, like, just kind of pull from it the good things. Yeah, yeah. Just sift. Yeah. Uh, did you have any anything you wanted to visit there? Mm -mm. I'm good. I just I liked that he was being kind of rude, <laughs> <laughs> and I liked that he spelled fantasies with a ph. That, that was, was those were my great notes. <laughs> that was a weird <laughs> spelling. All right, so we'll start with Saint Simon, and he uh, writes his his preeminent work in 1802. But uh, his big highlights are that he recognized the French Revolution as a class war, okay. not just between the nobility and the bourgeoisie, which is actually how we've characterized it in the past because we were dumb. Uh, but <laughs> also there's a third class in there, the non-possessors. Not quite yet the there proletariat, but people who didn't have shit, you know? Close. Yeah, he's getting there. He, um recognizes basically that that third estate was divided into two, the, the property bourgeoisie and everybody else. And for him, the division that was important was the one between workers and idlers. Yeah. I want to dig into this section because I was confused. Uh -huh. He says workers were not only the wage workers, but also the manufacturers. Okay. That one makes sense. The merchants, that one makes sense. The bankers, that one doesn't make as much sense to me. <laughs> Well, I thought those were bad. Uh, being the CEO of a bank is bad, and on the board of directors is bad, and these are people who should be really, like a teller. <laughs> yeah, I guess so because you know the other people should be seeking refuge when the revolution comes. Um, but the tellers, I mean, yeah, you know that's fine. They're workers; they're doing things. But I think from San Simone's point of view, uh, the bank did serve a purpose. The bank was there to facilitate credit. He talks about this a little later on, that like Saint Simone want, wanted to wanted to basically kind of like nationalize the bank in a way, and okay. like have it like run kind of a kind of a credit system. Regulate it says direct the whole of social production by the regulation of credit. Okay. So he kind of thought that the bank did serve a useful purpose, and honestly, if you're just talking about like providing credit for a community, like a like a a social uh, a community bank like that would not be a bad thing if you did still have like money if you're still in that initial phase or something mm -hmm. then, like that would be kind of okay you know it's like the bank and it's a wonderful life <laughs> yeah this yeah basically uh it's more of a kind of a community resource pool at that point yeah you know? yeah and that'd be cool so that's what he was looking at in terms of the bank i think uh was a way to change you know essentially change its nature from completely from what it is in, in capitalism <laughs> what if we had a bank but not but it was good <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's see okay so the next thing that he credits san simone with is declaring politics to be the science of production i highlighted that because i liked it yeah and uh but you know essentially saying that like eventually it all comes down to like providing for people, you know, what, how can we mm -hmm, figure mm -hmm. out how to allocate resources correctly? Um, and he foretold the complete absorption of politics by economics. Yeah. And that makes sense. I 
I remember when, you know, in my liberal days, I very much like did not know shit about economics. I still don't. But I, I was much more focused on social issues. And I thought like that was what we should focus on. And I was like, I don't know anything about that shit. So like, whatever. Mm -hmm. But now I'm like, oh, if you take care of economics, the social shit would also be taken care of. Yeah, they, they've got to be kind of working in tandem, working together. One without the other is broken. Doesn't work. Yeah, it's like, thanks for the representation. I'm dying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, basically he's saying Saint-Simon recognizes that economic conditions are the basis of political institutions. That's kind of like what we've said and what obviously we get from Marx and Engels is the base, the economic base being the determinant of the of the superstructure. Mm. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, Saint Simon doesn't know enough to put it that way, but that's what he's kind of credited. He's getting with. there. Yeah. Engel says we also see in Saint Simon the idea of the abolition of the state, the future conversion of political rule over men into an administration of things and a direction of processes of production. So that's what we're saying is like one day the state it's not that important, man. It's not a, you know, all it is is like, <laughs> how are we going to make sure that we've got enough? We're not going to argue over any, you know, anything else besides that really. Yeah. How does he make that leap? I mean, I'm assuming he, he just read his shit and he said something like that and he's telling us that. Yes. So. Okay, cool. I'm like, I don't see anything here. One thing I did not do is go in and be like, St. Simone, what was he about? I didn't care. Okay. I just took Engel's word for it pretty much. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> So yeah, that was the big highlights I got from that. Did you have any Saint Simone questions? Um, no. We talked about how. Okay, I, my only question was whenever he was writing to somebody and saying like, "What happened in France? Like they brought a famine." Like I was confused because uh, mm -hmm. I was like, "Was that who did that? Was okay. that the the poor?" Because he made it sound like it was because of the the working man did that, and I was like, "Oh, was that their fault?" So I don't know. <laughs> Because uh, what he's talking about is the reign of terror, okay, specifically, yeah. and the reign of terror is an interesting phase in the French Revolution. We don't have to, we shouldn't get too much into it, mm -mm. <laughs> but basically, in the early part of the first French Republic, this is early revolution, basically. Okay, okay, uh, they, you know, they overthrow the monarchy, they cut off the king's head and other people's heads, cool. and then the rest of Europe says, "Fuck you, we're going to war with you." Oh, okay. They get a coalition and they're like, let's destroy revolutionary France because those guys are, you know, killing kings and we're all ruled by kings. So <laughs> that's a bad look for us. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so they're constantly at war. They have enemies all over the place and they start basically getting paranoid and fighting against, you know, perceived outside in enemies and internal enemies as well. Not to say there weren't any, mm. there were, totally were. They set up the Committee of Public Safety and start, you know, putting people on trial and stuff for you know, helping foreign enemies for fomenting coups for whatever, for being counter-revolutionary. Okay. And this leads to, a, you know, eventually a lot of executions. Uh, but the reason he's saying that this is because of the, of the people of the workers or the, the lower classes and not the, and not the bourgeoisie mm -hmm. is because the bourgeoisie were doing this in response to popular actions. People were going mm. out in mobs and like killing people, you know, like, Oh, <laughs> This guy was like a priest or this guy like we used to be a banker or this guy, you know, used to help the cops arrest people or whoever it was like they would just go out there and freaking mob people and kind of awesome. kill people in the streets. <laughs> and it was one of their guys, Danton, Danton, maybe. I don't know. I don't know how to say it in French, but um, that's OK. When they're setting up this thing, he says, we have to be terrible or the people will be. Oh, so they have to do it officially or else people are just going to go around yeah. in mobs. Mm -hmm. OK, that makes sense. And so the way that San Simone is kind of blaming the reign of terror on the people is because the people were kind of, you know, pushing the yeah. bourgeoisie to do that, I guess. OK, OK. And it obviously it leads to, you know. Tons of people getting their heads chopped off. Even <laughs> Dan Tung, for example, gets his head chopped off by the reign of terror. Oh, Same with awkward. Maximilian Robespierre, who's like one of the big leaders of it. He eventually gets turned yeah. on. And so, and eventually that all falls into Napoleon's, you know, despotic reign. There's a vacuum. Yeah. No, it's, it doesn't work. And he says, that's, we tried, but people weren't ready. Okay. Okay. All right. Next. We got this Fourier guy. He looks really sad. Tell me about him. <laughs> Fourier. Um, Engels credits him here with criticizing bourgeois society and basically saying, 
It's shit. <laughs> yeah, I like some of his takes. He said, uh, this quote I liked. He was first to declare that in any given society, the degree of women's emancipation is the natural measure of the general emancipation. I like it. Hell yeah. We are only as free as the least among us. And in that time, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, it was not fun to be a woman then. Yeah, he's he's credited with that. He kind of compare. Generally, he's comparing the rose-colored phraseology, all the you know, highfalutin, everything's going to be great stuff that they were talking about before the revolution and compares it to how civilization actually looked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I thought this other part was interesting. He talks about like barbarism, like you, he's like, oh, you know, if you look back in history, you say that's barbaric. And it's like, I mean, it's barbaric now. It's just like different. It's just a different way of doing. It. You're not hitting people with clubs, but mm -hmm. you're like starving them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he does point that out. He also says the thing about in civilization. He kind of has a dialectic conception of it, or we'll get into that a little later. But he sees history as kind of like having these contradictions that it can't solve. Right? He talks about mm -hmm. uh, under civilization, poverty is born of superabundance itself. Right? I like this. I drew a little diagram. So, yeah, I think that gets to the core of capitalism is there has to be losers in capitalism. Like, not everyone can be rich. Not everyone can be a, a fucking small business owner. <laughs> yeah. And we'll see later that the process of producing more and more wealth for the capitalists in its, like, even when it's working right, eventually, like, destroys itself by making too much shit, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but he, he kind of credits that to... Fourier and saying, you know, also in every historical phase, it has its time of ascent and its time of decline, right? Uh, he mm -hmm. says, so does, you know, <laughs> so does humanity at some point, the ultimate destruction of the human race. Yeah, it doesn't feel too far off. <laughs> <laughs> Getting there. Well, if, you're, if your bingo cards are ready, we'll put one in for <laughs> Fourier's uh, predictions. Right. Ugh. And then he moves on to his next guy, Owen. Okay. I like Owen because he's got an easier name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He looks spooky in his picture, too. I like it. <laughs> yeah. He's ominous, shadowy. I like your vampire take on him. <laughs> I think he just, he looked like he needed it. It's good. That's how I see, that's how I mentally picture him now. No, he's a vampire. He seems nice, though. I feel like I drew all these doodles before reading about them, so it was fun to go back and be like, oh, this guy seemed nice, Yeah. <laughs> but I made him into a vampire. Fourier's crying makes sense in that context. He's just like looking at society and crying, you know, like, why? He's like, oh, man, humanity's going to end. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> but no, so Owen, he kind of sets it up that he's from England. He's in the home of the Industrial Revolution. Everything's in full swing there, right? He's... A materialist is one big thing about him. He sees mm -hmm. people's character as partially the result of their environment. Yeah. Well, let me try to give my dummy explanation. Mm -hmm. So this guy, I think, is a great example of someone who he's like a nice capitalist, right? Yeah. Like he's trying to be nice to his workers. Mm -hmm. And he's so nice that eventually he realizes, like, this isn't enough. And I love that. Yes. That's 100% right, dude. Um, he is, yeah, he's in charge of this cotton mill and he's super nice. He like <laughs> pays people, uh, you know, even when they, they have to shut down for a while, uh, mm -hmm. they work, oh man, they barely work, man. They're only working 10 and a half hours <laughs> instead of 14, you know, fucking chill work day. Yeah. <laughs> he provides education for them. And realizes at some point, yeah, you're right. He realizes at some point that basically they're still slaves, man. They're still like, they still have to show up here and work. They don't have a choice. They have to do it. And they're, you know, at my mercy. And that's not yeah. cool. Yeah. And I thought it was really interesting because he continuing along that, like, I just, in my head, it's a shorthand of just a friendly capitalist E. Warren type kind mm -hmm. of thing. Like, even when he's like, I'm taking care of these people and like, look, it means I'm more productive. Like for most people, that's a win check mark. Good job. You proved that it's good to be nice to your workers. But then he continues that line of questioning and goes, all right, it's more productive. So I made more of a profit. Who's getting this profit? And mm -hmm. that's the fucking key. Yeah. 
he, that's that's the question that gets him into trouble, right? Where did the extra money go? <laughs> Yeah, I love that they talk about how he was really popular for his philanthropy, Everyone and then he started him. talking about like sharing the profits, and they're like, "Oh wait, no, we don't like that part." <laughs> yeah, no, he was he was popular enough to like give um, addresses to the Queen of England to Parliament, oh, and say like, "Hey, this is a cool plan. We should do this." You know, he he gave an address to the U.S. Congress and told them like, "Hey, these are some good plans. We should do this." Um, and he, you know, had been this darling or whatever. He had been just this brilliant man who was super nice and was just, you know, visionary. Mm -hmm. And then he starts, you know, telling people, actually, what we should do is some <laughs> communism. <laughs> then they turned on him. <laughs> they hated that. Everyone hated that. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward. And, uh, yeah, man, he, he, he kind of gets ruined because he's going up against like the, what, what Engels calls the three great obstacles to social reform, private property, religion, and the present form of marriage. AKA my least favorite things. <laughs> it's like Oprah's favorite things, but opposite. My least favorite. Yeah. And so, yeah, he's, he's, he's a pariah. He tries some communist experiments in America, but he fails. He ends up, you know, he credits him with continuing to, the fight for workers or whatever. He, he does the, like the time guy we talked about. Uh, he sets up like a time exchange thing. Mm -hmm. Who was the other time guy? That was uh, Josiah Warren. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Who sets up the Cincinnati time store and all that. <laughs> yeah. He does the same thing. He had been influenced by Owen. He actually had previously lived in one of Owen's uh, communities. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah. So he did get that, that idea friends. from him about the labor notes and stuff. Uh, Engel says, yeah, you know, this is kind of like a good first step, a good idea. It's not like he, he was smart to recognize it wasn't a fix to everything, but it was like, okay, mm -hmm. you know? So ultimately he ends up saying about the utopians, basically their socialism, they saw it as, you know, the expression of absolute truth, reason, and mm -hmm. justice, you know, all it had to be, all you had to do was like, show people this and they would be like, oh man, you're right. And they would, you know, <laughs> adopt it. I call it West Wing brain. <laughs> You're the smartest guy in the room, obviously. Mm, yeah. The, the, you know, but the flip side, of course, is that these three guys don't even have the same theories. Like uh, somebody's, you know, not all of them can be right. There, there's, there's some degree mutually exclusive. It leads to fighting or it leads to what he calls this average socialism, this sad thing that like offers no, offends nobody really, but does nothing. Yeah. Like watered down. Yeah. And I was like, ouch. <laughs> that got me right here. Yeah. I've, we've, we've, we've tried to be cafeteria socialists in the past. And, um, Engel said, that's fucking stupid. Yep. That's, it's a sick burn on us. Yeah. We should probably pick something, huh? I'm thinking so. And this actually has <laughs> pushed me in that direction. I think so. I don't know. I might declare a tendency here today. We'll see. Oh, okay. Um, well, Stay basically tuned. he's out to, you know, he says like, yeah, don't, don't be, don't think that it's all in your head. Don't, you know, just come up with the best theory, like <laughs> figure it out, figure out what's correct and do it. Mm -hmm. That's a summer summary there, I guess. Okay. All right. This next section sucked. <laughs> Dialectics. You don't I like this next it. section? No, it's just boring ass philosophy shit. Like this sounds like he got real high but like was a nerd and ugh. All right. Let's start with the vocab then for the dialectic section. So first dialectics, what is it? Yeah. What the fuck is that? He talks about it a lot. And I don't know what it is. So that really hindered my reading. Really? You came away with it without knowing what it was altogether? I had a, it, is it theory? Is that what it is? I don't know. Mm, it is a particular way of looking at the world, looking at the world as a constantly a constant state of change constantly changing specifically between opposites okay okay the unity and conflict of opposites is how he puts it okay so things kind of contain within them their opposites or um like we think about things in terms of their opposites like uh it's cold outside well what does it mean by it's cold it's not hot right okay okay like that's kind of necessary to the thing is that it's not the other thing Okay, so it's kind of like the idea of, of relativity in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but not just that. It's also that everything is changing between those, you know, those two opposite states. Um, he mentions the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus, 
And the, in the footnotes, and I, it also mentions um, ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, and uh, it's this thought that uh, no man ever steps in the same river twice. Okay, yeah, I've heard that. Because both the river and the man will have changed. Oh, shit. See, this is that shroom shit. It is the shroom <laughs> shit. But dialectics, all it's saying is that the world is not this static thing, that things in the world have a process, things in the world are constantly changing, and they're constantly changing between what they seem to be and what they are not. You know, we here are alive, but we're also dying. You know, the, That's true, the shit. The solar system here, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's here, but it's also gradually dying. Um, yeah. You know, trees are growing, but they're also dying. I mean, you know, the, everything's dying. Everything's right. dying. Everything is. Uh, <laughs> Happy Christmas. <is> change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, but everything also fluctuates and is also being reborn as it's dying mm -hmm. because it's like it, your cells and shit. It's a circle. Yeah. It's, it's moving in, in a different, in a, in a flow. Okay. So what the fuck does this have to do with communism? <laughs> I read this whole section and I was like, why did I do that? Okay. Uh, well, dialectics basically um, in that sense, it, it's setting up that unity and conflict of opposites. So opposing things, right? Both being and, and not being fluctuating between the two. That's going to be important when we get to looking at history, because you're going to take that dialectic thing and look at history that way and say, okay, we've got this system. It's got these antagonisms these opposites how are those going to work itself their, themselves out and that's how he's going to understand mm. how class how these class systems of you know ancient slave societies feudalism capitalism how that all like moves through history that's the key to understanding it so it's like the rise so it's like the rise and fall of things mm -hmm. And in how those are kind of built into the thing itself. Like, uh, yeah, it's like if, if you're king, you're so good at being king, you get super rich. Well, eventually that's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. I should rewrite this. <laughs> <laughs> what if I rewrote it to like three sentences? <laughs> Shit changes. We're all dying. Overthrow the bankers. <laughs> yeah. Done. We're done here. <laughs> Another definition we need to know is idealism. Okay, that sounds pretty straightforward. And well, idealism versus materialism. This is like kind of a, you know, two different ways of looking at things. So, ooh, is idealism the one where you you think it's the reason? Like it's it's like those enlightenment guides guys. Yeah, uh, idealism okay. is the way of seeing things as like the material world or the world we're in. Right, everything outside our brains mm -hmm. is shaped by our brain, shaped by our ideas. The real thing, the real important thing is what we think. And we kind of, you know, impose that. That's the primary mover of things that happen in the world. All right. That sounds pretty snooty. When the tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, it does not make a sound. <laughs> okay. Not true, but okay. Materialism is the opposite of that. It's a mm. way of viewing the material world as the foundation of ideas the 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 maker of ideas basically you know the ideas in your brain man even that is coming from a material thing because it's you know brain processes and stuff i like that as a budding as a budding witch i like this idea it's all back to the earth man <laughs> <laughs> there you go yeah um thoughts are a reflection of what's going on outside so like whatever is happening we are perceiving that and that's you know creating the thoughts not mm -hmm. we're imposing whatever on the outside world. When the tree falls in the forest, it makes a sound whether we're there to hear it or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's materialism versus idealism. And we'll get into that here in a bit. And we'll be brief because, like you said, this section is not as, not as cool. <laughs> it's really not. But it's, I, think, I think it does have some importance. So Engels kind of, uh, uh, the way I put it is, takes a detour into the history of philosophy. Yeah, he does. It's important because it does put dialectics in its context, but that's about it. Yeah. So he starts by proposing everything is interrelated in some way. Mm -hmm. Every, his quote is, everything moves, changes, comes into being, and passes away. Everything is and is not, for everything is fluid. Okay. Freshman <laughs> philosophy major. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> he sounds like he just lit up his very first joint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he kind of elaborates and he says... Well, great. Okay. 
Cool. That doesn't help you really explain things, though. That's like the basic observation that even the ancient Greek philosophers were able to come to, but they realized they needed to have some better way of explaining things that happen in the world. Phenomena, right? Mm hmm So that they, they've made science. Yeah. How does right? that work? We'll make science. Yeah. And in science, in natural science, historical research or whatever, they start studying things in isolation, breaking things down and saying, oh, well, this is the component parts. These, this is how it all works together. The problem arises when they're categorizing and, and isolating all of these things in nature. They take that back to their philosophy. And so the next philosophy that arises is metaphysics, okay, which is just the enlightenment way of thinking, this idealist sort of thing. Okay. Everything is either positively or negatively one thing or the other, this or that. Yes or no, eternal, fixed, exclusive, absolute. Only Sith deals in absolutes, though. Yeah, yeah, it was, um, yeah, so that's his critique is that, no, that's, that's like wrong. <laughs> it's not that. <laughs> All right, so let me summarize. Mm -hmm. So first step is like, whoa, everything's always changing. This world is crazy. It's yeah. chaos. Like this is kind of like almost like a creation myth, you know, where like in the Greek creation myth, it's like first there was nothing. It was chaos. It was crazy. And then- mm -hmm. And then metaphysics is like, no, we got to study this and break it down. And so let me just like break it into these individual parts. But then they individualize it so much that they're like, all right, everything has an answer now. I did it. Right? Yes, pretty much. Like everything has a definable answer that is specifically this or that. Yeah. It's, there aren't, there's no duality between things or change. It's static. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Engel says, you know, this is this is bullshit. It cannot see the woods for the trees, basically. Yeah, I highlighted that. I was like, you should have just said that, man. Yep. Yeah, that's the shortened version <laughs> of it. It's just like, <laughs> these guys got way too specific, and then everything was just like, oh, it's this. Mm -hmm. and, and he has a little analogy here, because he says, you know, metaphysics ignores, like, how things change and are ever fluid. He talks about the beginning of life. He says that there are these jurists who have cudgeled their brains in vain to discover a rational limit beyond which the killing of a child in its mother's womb is murder. It's just as impossible to determine absolutely the moment of death. That's true. The science of death is very confusing. <laughs> I'll just say that. Because like different parts shut down at different times and it's like, all right, what do you count as dead? Yeah, you kind of have to, you know, pick a definition and go with it. It's a slow process. There's, you know, something called the paradox of the heap, which is where you have a, you know, a heap of sand. Mm -hmm. You can take away one grain of sand at a time. When does it not a heap anymore? Ooh, I like that. Right. So we're constantly, you know, growing at a part of our life and constantly dying. It's a super slow process. And we're, and he says later, that like we're, this is where he said that like, maybe he took some shrooms or something. Cause he's <laughs> like, you know, Oh, all Let's the bodies the cells. in your cells, man, you know, all the cells in your body, man. Yeah. That's you're replacing those <laughs> gradually. You're a new person after a while. Like, Oh man. <laughs> so, okay. So basically he's arguing for nuance and like a spectrum and yeah, I like that because I, I believe in nuance. That sounds good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what dialectics is about is the opposites, the, you know, the thing containing within itself, both, you know, what you see it as, what you, what it is and its opposite, it's, it's negation. Okay. And metaphysics is, you know, stupid because it only says it's just this one thing. <laughs> okay. Dialectics, however, can take into account that everything changes. Okay. Um, he kind of talks about how dialectics is shown in nature. Yeah, I was kind of confused about this part. <laughs> uh, he tries to kind of draw some examples in evolution, saying uh -huh. Darwin kind of proved this because before, right, people were just classifying animals and saying, oh, this is separate from this, and this is why this is mm -hmm. a thing and this is not. Just defining them. Like we said with the metaphys metaphysics mm -hmm. guys, it's absolutes. And this Darwin was saying, like, this is actually a slow process of change that, you know, everything is always changing. Just, he said, that's dialectics, uh, right? Okay. So that's interesting because I think I'm just being on fucking social media. I am automatically turning this like culturally. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting because I think people crave a lot of that metaphysics, like kind of view of just like absolute truth. And I think 
that's what gets a lot of attention is like, no, this is it. This is what we should do, you know? Oh, yeah. And I, I think in the internet, especially, there's just not room for that nuance. And it's very hard to find spaces that are accommodating of it. Like, even now, like, you know, not to date this podcast, but like, we're talking about the early days of the vaccine. And there's all kinds of posts going around. Anytime someone says like, hey, I have allergies, what do I need to know? People come in and shut down and be like, no, you shouldn't be talking about this because you're discouraging people from taking the vaccine. It's like, what if they have an issue with it? Like, we also need to talk about that. Yeah. That's, you know. Nuance. There's, yeah, <laughs> we need it. And people want to, you're right, come in with their own, come in with the eternal truth, the example of reason. And like Engel says, man, hey, if you guys all have your example of reason somebody's fucking wrong like <laughs> mm -hmm. and we all think we have the reason like people who are mad like someone if you don't want to take the vaccine they're just like well then you deserve it it's like there's something called herd immunity we actually need everyone to take it yeah. <laughs> like we can't just condemn people mm -hmm. yeah but. so yeah he kind of points that out in, in science in terms of the theory of evolution he also talks about in the solar system how previously people were just like, oh, yeah, these celestial bodies, man, they run eternal. Always been there, it's, always will be. Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> actually, no, it wasn't always there. And so it's probably not always going to be there. Like, they, you know, they figured it out that, hey, eventually all this stuff's going to either collapse or get too far apart or something. It's going to fuck up one way or the other. At least our sun will go supernova and we probably wiped ourselves out by then. But that's a side point is. Everything's becoming and unbecoming, right? Everything's... Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to sprinkle that in. <laughs> and then he gets to a guy that he really has a love-hate relationship with here, Hegel. Yeah, this guy looks freaked out in his pick. <laughs> okay, I was trying to figure out if was he eating bread or what, but... No, that's like a handkerchief. He's dabbing his forehead. Ah, uh -huh, okay, I see. Hegel. He brings up, he, Hegel was a German idealist philosopher. His great contribution was applying this dialectical thinking to history and showing human history as a process, the evolution of humanity itself. All right. Uh, my review of this guy was that he was boring. <laughs> he is. No, dude. I, so I tried to do some investigation into Hegelian thought or whatever and like what the fuck he was about. It's, his problem is he's an idealist and Engels mm -hmm. criticizes, criticizes him for this. But the real problem for me with idealists is that they write so abstractly and they're all talking about like <laughs> the form, the absolute, the blah, and, and just like, this doesn't have any real words. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> These are all just concepts. Yeah. Yeah. Like this part fucking, I would say galaxy brain, but that implies some sort of epiphany. So <laughs> this part was just inscrutable. Yeah. To him, the thoughts within his brain were not the more or less abstract pictures of actual things and processes, but conversely, things and their evolution were only the realized pictures of the idea existing somewhere from eternity before the world was. What the fuck did I just read? Okay, so this I, this is a small <laughs> part I actually get from Hegel uh, because it's so central, I guess, to him being an idealist. This is what idealists do. The thoughts in your brain are the actual are realized pictures of the idea so for hegel there has to be some sort of being beyond us basically a god or some sort of form of it that okay where the real stuff comes from with the real thoughts and forms and, and things that like truly are exist and so like in our brain we get like images of that or picture representations of that those are the real you know closer to real things not the actual things in the world. That's very confusing. So like I look at a tree and I'm like, that tree isn't real until I see the tree. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Uh, that's stupid. Yeah, no, it's dumb. And that's why he says, you know, this way of thinking <laughs> turned everything upside down, completely reversed the actual connection of things in the world. Right. He also calls it a colossal miscarriage, sick burn. It's, yeah. It's just this guy almost, he almost had, he's like dialectics, history, got it. But he thinks that history marches along based on this idea conceived in the mind of this higher being. Mm, okay. Okay. And Engels is just like, that's fucking bullshit, man. History moves in a different way. <laughs> Not. And uh, one interesting, I don't know. And <laughs> I was watching, I was watching football the day before we recorded this. And so I've got a sports analogy here questionable usefulness for you yeah we'll but maybe see. it helps a listener or two i don't know all right so idealists think that their ideas shape the world right 
So imagine if you're new to coaching a team, a football team or any sports team, really, you get to a new team, new season, an idealist would come to it and say, we're going to win this season by applying my brilliant new coaching ideas. Oh, right? but a materialist would be like, this guy's good at kicking. Yes. I'm gonna yeah. Build my strategy around that. It's not a good plan to go the idealist way and, and just be like, let's do this thing. Like, what if your team's not a good fit, right? You're like, I need mm -hmm. a, a mobile quarterback, but my guy's a sack of potatoes or whatever, right? You try to change the material conditions of your team with your ideas. That might work if you're lucky, but it probably, you know, it has a good <laughs> chance of failing because it doesn't actually, you know, change things. <laughs> That makes sense. You're right. The opposite, the materialist approach would sit there and look at their team and be like, oh, this guy's good at this. This guy's good at that. Right. And then you formulate your strategy from there. The material conditions of your team shaped your theory of coaching. Okay. Okay. That one worked on me. Good job. All right. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's idealism versus materialism. Cool. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, Engels sums up by saying, Hegel, almost good, but idealist <laughs> uh, and that he and Marx fixed it. They did it. So that's good. Yeah. Um, they made them modern or what we call materialist dialectics. Uh, some people call them dialectical materialism. This is technically a later term. I've heard that it's, it's referring to the same thing. Constant change in the material world is the thing that's real, not our ideas. Our ideas just are shaped by that. Okay. And then he goes on to, introduce the idea of applying this to history and saying, okay, as working class movements, class struggle starts to be seen throughout Europe, modern industry starts to grow. We have to have a new understanding as his of history because the idealists, they don't know what the hell's going on. You know, they're like, mm -hmm. oh, oh, oh no. <laughs> and he, he uses the phrase that we've seen before in the communist manifesto, right? All past history was the history of class struggles. Mm-hmm. This is what you get when you go back and look at history with materialist dialectics, right? Engel says basically that society's rules, politics, religion, in short, its ideas are actually, you know, just a superstructure that emerges from that economic base. Again, materialism here, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, if I'm understanding this like process of understanding history correctly, First, we saw history as like a metaphysical thing of like, this is this is what we should do. So like, I'm thinking, you know, king times, you mm -hmm. know, like this is the way it should be. And then you have idealistic times, which is the enlightenment, which is like, nah, man, like obviously it's smarter to like do this. And so they, they had their day in the sun mm -hmm. and now we're getting to materialism. Now we're getting, yeah, back to materialism, but in a different way. Right. Not, mm, he yeah. says, not the crude uh, materialism of just gathering things together, but a materialism that realizes that, you know, these things are constantly changing. Mm -hmm. Wait, what's the crude one? So the crude, the, the old materialism was just when people were like gathering facts and everything and just being like, oh, here's an, you know, here's a, a leaf. These are its, you know, little component parts and everything. Oh, classified. I didn't realize that was called that too. Uh, he just refers to it as, as material, like mechanical materialism, like mm, classifying, observing. Yes. Yeah. And that's what, where, where you're talking about the metaphysics people. Um, that's kind of what they were looking at. Right. And then you get to the idealists. I'm also, man, I'm making a lot of connections, mm -hmm. like analogies this episode. This <laughs> reminds me of like the scientific process too, yes. you know, like you observe you and then you like idealism's like here's my fucking hypothesis or my theory or whatever. And then you just turn then it in materialism, without doing an experiment. Yeah. <laughs> That's idealism. Exactly, yeah. And the <laughs> and the materialism actually does the work. Okay, cool. Yes, yeah. Idealism just writes up the lab report <laughs> and then the you know, the professor gets it and is like So that's not how that works at all, dude. <laughs> But it should work that way. <laughs> Come on. Reason. Uh, Facts. Yes, exactly. That's a good one. All right. I got another I need a translation sentence. All right. But now idealism was driven from its last refuge, the philosophy of history. Now a materialistic treatment of history was propounded and a method found of explaining man's knowing by his being instead of as heretofore his being by his knowing. All right. Yeah. You're going to have to break that down for me. What the fuck? 
All right. So he describes this as a process of like Hegel being the cool guy because he did the dialectics thing, right? We're no longer saying history is just this static thing, but it changes. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. You know, but he was wrong because he thought it was shaped by ideas. That man's being, that his reality in this world was primarily moved by people by his knowing, by people coming up with ideas, particularly by great men, by individuals coming up with a new way of doing things. And that's what moves society. And he says, oh. idealism now has been removed from, we're, we're removing that from history. That's stupid. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're now instead going to look at it materially so that man's ideas is knowing, you know, humanity coming up with new ideas and stuff is shaped by their economic conditions or by their material world by their being okay so like i'm christine like the original thought was i'm christine because i have these unique thoughts in my brain that's why i'm christine but the new idea materialism is i'm christine because like my parents raised me in this place and this this and this yes Mm -hmm. well it's also that in the first example you are christine because you conceive of yourself that way. Mm-hmm. The new one is you conceive of yourself as Christine because of those things. Yeah. Yeah. They made me into me. Yeah. Okay. That is a lot easier for me. Got it. All right. <laughs> so yeah, he goes on. I like this next part. He kind of does a good call back to the utopians. Um, and he says that, you know, with this new, with this dialectical materialism, with socialism being a science, a scientific approach to it instead of instead of what we were doing we we no longer are just looking at capitalism and saying yeah that's that sucks dude you know <laughs> yeah uh i mean this is basically me before the pod being like i, I don't like it but i don't have a solution <laughs> those were the utopians and that's why it kind of you know honestly i think a lot of people start this way right a lot of people start out you know as liberals or something and then start thinking for themselves as like what could we do that's better? We start trying to dream up a perfect society to replace it, right? I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Like he says, its task was no longer to manufacture a system of society as perfect as possible. But I I like that because we see that a lot. Like we've talked about utopians in the past episodes too. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, instead of just saying like, boom, here's new perfect society, like here's planet B, let's fucking move over there and do it. Instead, it's saying, okay, like, let's look at what we have fucking got right now and build on that. Yes. Yeah. And that's the important distinction. And I don't know. We have we have these kind of sympathies for the utopians. We all love a commune we kinda, here. Yeah. We kind of have a little bit of it in us that's like, <laughs> oh, why can't we just do that? That sounds nice. I know. But Engel says it's wrong, dude. Engel says, like, don't do that. Engels isn't the boss of me. No. There should be no bosses, but... <laughs> <laughs> He's, I'm I'm low key trying to get people to move into my neighborhood to start a commune. So like <laughs> whatever. <laughs> he says, yeah, like you said, instead examine what's happening economically, identify within it fundamental contradictions. That dialectic, right? This and not this. The contradictions, mm-hmm. the keys to its downfall. That's what you'll bring it down mm. with. Not coming up with the best idea, but figuring out what actually will do it based on what you see. Yeah. To find a way to bring it about naturally, I guess. Mm-hmm. It's like in your analogy of the uh, of the of doing the lab experiment. You can mm-hmm. try to write down what you think it would be the best, you know, way to make the reaction happen, or you can study it and figure it out and actually put the yeah. right shit together. That's true. So Engels wraps up the section and saying, "says socialism has become a science." So now we're scientists. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll get us some embroidered lab coats. We'll, yeah, we'll do the next episode wearing lab coats. Um, <laughs> and it became a science through two of Marx's great discoveries. He gives a shout out to his to his bro, Marx. <laughs> the the two discoveries were the, the materialist conception of history mm-hmm. and the revelation of the secret of capitalistic production through surplus value. That sounds shady as shit. All it means... Um, is that capitalists make money by exploiting the workers, by paying them less okay, yeah. than the value they extract from them, even when they're paying them a fair wage. Yeah, that shouldn't be a secret. <laughs> no, and you know, nowadays it's not. People know that unless they're like, well, I don't know. A lot of people, I guess, are misinformed. You know? People don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> you would think people know that. but Yeah. And we made it out of the dialectic section. Pretty short. Oh, okay. Oof. We kept it brief. It felt, it felt longer <laughs> than it was. 
<laughs> All right, that was part one of our discussion of this reading. Next time, we will cover the third section of this document, historical materialism, the good stuff. Hope you enjoyed this part. Tune in next week for that. In the meantime, you can find us online. We are on Twitter at Teach Communism, Instagram at Teach Me Communism. You can send us an email, teachmecommunism at gmail.com. If you want to ask a question, make a suggestion for a future episode, give us compliments so I can rub them into my skin for youth and longevity. If you also want to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, that would be great. That really helps people find the show. So please do that. Rate and review. Do both. It'd be great. I love it. We love our reviewers, except for the bad ones. Tune in next week for another episode of Teach Me Communism, where the class struggle is always in session. I love when I get to do the intro. All right. Bye. Bye.